Hey everybody, Tag Life Done Free. Hey, last night I had a really cool um, opportunity to go up to a little town called Hiawatha and to listen to um, a lady talk about the ways that you can fight back against some of these big governmental programs and land grabs. As many of you know, and we've talked about on my channel before, there's a big land grab going on right now that consists over a hundred million acres across the United States, mostly right through the bread belt. Um, and they're going to eminent domain this land and they're going to take this land from these farmers for the purposes of putting in a um, energy corridor. Some of these corridors are five miles wide and some of them are 20 and 30 and 40 miles wide and they go for long stretches. Um, I'm, over 11 million acres are going to be taken in Kansas alone um, if this goes through. We had a great opportunity to talk to someone who has spent some time doing exactly this and fighting and doing these kinds of things through resolutions and through protest petitions. Um, the tools that are out there uh, that we have legally can make a difference, um, but you got to know how. And so this is a super important video, everybody, and I really encourage you to take the time to listen to it. I know that it's over an hour long, and I know that, that we're all busy, but this is important. And um, I'm going to quote one of our community members who was there with us last night. And um, I'm not going to mention them by name, but uh, she had said to me, she had said, hey, Tag, um, I thought that I was already blackpilled as far as I could be blackpilled. But apparently she got blackpilled some more. So anyway, if you're interested in the meeting, if you're interested in this great information, I really encourage you to come on. Let's check it out. Thank you, and, and my friends. So everybody got introduced. 
used to best. I call her Grams, which is a sweetheart story. She joined me in this fight in 2021, and she decided that at the right old age of 50 that I am, she decided she wanted a kid, never having had children of her own. And so at the age of 51, I got adopted. <laughs> now that kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? And I would tell you beforehand that I know exactly who I am. Uh, but then I got a name on my birth certificate. Folks, I'm bonafide. I'm absolutely bonafide, which is awesome. So thank you, Grams. Grams is a nervous speaker, so so be patient with her. I asked her to come up here because she's the one that's done the health um, surveys and really the deep dive into this transmission line. So how I'm going to do this is I'm going to start backwards. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you the things that you can do and the ways to fight this back. Planning Commission board members are not going to like me much. I apologize. Sorry. That, that, that does involve that. And then um, we're going to go into the details of why we want to do that, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers afterwards, OK? So I stated as everybody was coming in, so afterwards, these are interactive maps. They are on public websites. The only one that's not is this CRP map here. All the rest are interactive. So what that means is you can scroll all the way down into the individual parcels within your neighborhood and take a look at these maps. So afterwards, come up and take a look at them. There's also a whole bunch of books up here, various um, planning and commission type books, as well as book that Norman Kincaid wrote, there are two of them, and one of these are on successful things that were done to fight them back. Now these are not a novel, these are like a semester course, and inside of them the most valuable information that I have found is the exact wording that I want to use for freedom of information request should you want to pursue that avenue. They're available on Amazon, so you can take a preview. He sells them for just at cost, so that he can get them out to people as much as possible. He would love, he would love to be here, but he's older than dinosaurs. He doesn't like to travel very often. So I'm going to delve right in. As you came in, there was a block of paperwork out there on the table. So one of those pieces of papers is kind of a standard form letter. One of the things that we found out when we talked to, it was actually Congressman Tracy Mann, when we told him about the National Heritage Area that was going in, he said to me, Angel, you're telling me they're lying to me. Well, that opened the question of who are they and how long have they been lying? Come to find out, the board of that federal jurisdiction trying to go in had been soliciting Congress for up to five years. What we're discovering is, is they are opening these plans at the very last minute trying to keep the public from being aware of them. And then while spending five to ten years soliciting Congress, telling Congress that you love it, it's wonderful, nobody objects, look, we have nothing to, to show any evidence of, object, of objection. So we produced form letters that are out there on the table, one to the U.S. Department of Energy, one to the Federal Energy Man Management Program Director. You don't have to use these letters. The most important thing on them is the address to send them to. If there are other addresses that you want to send them to, by golly, do that. It gives you an idea of what to, um, what to send in. If you use this standard form, that's great. You can fill that out and send this in. You can rewrite it yourself. You can use your own wording. The only thing we do is ask you to be respectful. If you wouldn't want to read it, don't ask anybody else to read it either, right? So what happens is, is when I drop a Freedom of Information request, it'll say how many people were for and how many people were against in letters. It won't give me your name, it will not give me your address or any of the details of your letter, only whether you were in favor or against that letter, against that idea. So, and this is um, in particular on the, these form letters are on the transmission line that we have sitting out there. But you can really do it for any project that's coming your way. The um, bottom of this, the last part, says, um, and I'm going to read this to you, I request to view all studies as required by the National Environmental Policy Act involved in moving this project to fruition. 
So you have the um, endangered species, historical preservation, economic studies. All of these were supposed to be done whenever the federal government uses any federal dollars or any private industry uses federal dollars, they are required to do these studies. It's not going to stop them, but it can delay them. And the most important thing about that is, is that gives you time, because remember, by the time you find out about them, you're coming in late. What this will do is buy time so you can change the narrative to Congress and let them know this was not a good idea to begin with. So that's, a, that's one idea that you can do. You can do all of these individually and do them all together at the same time. The other idea is a resolution. And you can do a resolution on anything. You don't like um, uh, the National Heritage Area. We did them on trails. We did them on EPA uh, waste not water management on 3530. We've done a lot of resolutions. You can do them individually per subject. You can wrap them all together. The latest 3530 resolutions include all jurisdictions that we can think of. We have success stories with those. We beat back the Kansas-Nebraska Heritage Area Partnership. There are 49 counties that were you know, designated for that uh, federal boundary, and 45 counties have passed resolutions in opposition, and they went away. There was an EPA, I don't know if you know this, an EPA rule that got released that was supposed to go into effect in January of 2024 that would require every meat processor, no matter how small, to have the same wastewater treatment that every municipality has. That would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars right out of the gate, plus you have to get people to hire to maintain your permit, and that's how they would do it. Unless you did this, you would not get a permit. If you didn't get a permit, you didn't get your USDA license to operate. That's how that was going to go down. We only had seven resolutions by seven counties and a couple of Republican groups that did it. So with seven resolutions, Chris Kobach got involved, Ron Estes got together with the Missouri legislature and they came up with a beef act to be funded. And it worked. We just got notified this week that it's been defunded. <laughs> Subject of that case, 
they likely will. So resolutions are very, very effective. It does not have to be a government. I want to stress that. Here in Kansas, we worked hard with county governments, but it does not have to be a government. In Southeast Colorado, they had a national heritage area going in, and they got their cattlemen's associations, their soybean associations, and various associations to do resolutions, and that was enough. They were getting success even before the county got involved. So those are the resolutions. Now I'm going to give you the, the last idea. Your fence, your, your back is against the wall. You have the Tower of Battle going in next door to you. Okay? You've tried everything. You've done resolutions. You've done letters. You've done everything. You're getting nowhere. So now what do you do? I'm going to apologize again to the Planning Commission. Kansas law allows something called a protest petition. So after the process, there's two types. There's two types of protest petition. There's one for planning and zoning, and then there's one focused primarily on ballot initiatives. If you don't have planning and zoning in your county, what that protest petition would look like is that you want a ballot initiative. And you have to write exactly what that ballot initiative you want for your county. If you do have planning and zoning, then that protest petition comes after the decisions have already been made to put that Tower of Babylon in the parking lot next to you. You have a 14-day window. And the reason I'm telling you this now is because you might end up with your backs up against the wall on some of these projects, and you need to be able to plan this out ahead of time. Because once the decision is made for that project to go through, you have 14 days to get your protest petition done. For anything that has to do with land on, with a county that has planning and zoning, that means that that petition is not a sheet of paper where everybody fills it out. It is per parcel. You have to get 20% of all neighboring landowners, all parcels, 20% of them, to do a protest petition. It's per parcel, so if you have a husband and wife couple that owns that parcel, it's per parcel, not per individual goes by the parcel. It has to be signed, and it has to be notarized. It has to be. Now, you think that that's difficult to do, and it's, it is impossible. I've done it twice now. So, and, and once me personally, and the second group did it down in Pikes Lake, can you imagine one day you wake up and somebody tells you that there's state legislation for a new reservoir on your property for 10,000 acres, with state legislation asking the state to create a district so that they can start the process to build a new re recreational reservoir on your property. Those folks got in here, they had a big um, event, and they brought all the landowners to that event, and they had somebody there with a notary and a standard form letter, and they got it done. They ended up with like 54% instead of the 20%. So it, it can be done. We totally messed it up in Lyon County. I did a total uh, protest petition. It was my first time. I didn't know what we were doing. We needed about 500 signatures in 14 days in the middle of a COVID lockdown, and Lyon County did lockdown. We got 1,500 signatures. So it can be done. It can be done. So um, county attorneys hate for me to tell you this because it is a lot of work because you have to start with their office. Kansas law requires that you go into your county, uh, your county attorney, and you start the process there. You do not have to ask the county attorney's permission. Nowhere in Kansas law does it say that. So even if they discourage you, you can still do it, but you have to start in their office at a very minimum. They have to be informed. Preferably, they need to work with you, especially if it's a ballot measure for the exact wording that needs to be done. So that is the biggest, with your back up against the wall. Somebody asked me earlier that they thought that this was gonna come. This actually came up in question down in Oklahoma. Uh, I met some folks down there that are get, getting eminent domain for transmission lines. So if you're back up against the wall, you've done a protest petition, you've done everything, and it all now comes down to court, my best advice to you would be to not get an attorney within your district. They all know each other. They're all friends with each other. And it's really hard for me to get really mad at my mom 
and not defend her, right? And, and not want to please her. So it's just human nature. Your lawyers and your judges are probably wonderful, fantastic people, but you want to take that human nature and that personal relationship out of the equation when it comes down to your property. So now I'm going to tell you about all of these maps behind me, and then I'm going to give let Grams take over with the um, transmission line details, okay? So this map back here is CRP. So CRP isn't necessarily paying farmers not to farm at all. Some of that is grazed, some of that is haze, paid, some of that is wetlands, some of that has um, end dates of three years, five years, or ten years. A few of those are perpetual, especially when you get into the wetland type conservation easement. So put that in perspective, every green dot on that map is 1,000 acres. Okay? I want you to think about how much land is in some kind of a conservation program. This map over here with the blue on it, that is forever perpetual conservation easement recognized by the USDA that does not cover Ducks Unlimited or any private perpetual conservation easement. It's only there are partnerships, I think Nature Conservancy conservation easements are on there, but if they are partnered with the federal government, they're on there. That is forever conservation easement. So all that blue is perpetual conservation easements. And that is an interactive map where you can scroll all the way into your neighborhood to take a look at that. What is important about that map is the concentration of where they're going. They're going along the major rivers and around federal land. So what happens when you put land into a perpetual conservation easement is you freeze it in time at that moment right then and there. Now, even though your kids want to farm your place, they're going to move where the technology is because that's where the money is. You guys know how tight it is to make money off farming your land. If you don't advance with technology, you start losing dollars, right? Well, your kids are going to advance and move off where the technology is, even if they stay in agriculture. And when you lock that land into a perpetual conservation easement, you are blocking that freezing of technology. And then when you do that, when there's enough, look at that concentration around federal lands there. When there's enough and enough people have moved out, now you start taking your tire guys and your implement dealers and your welders and everything that supports agriculture and eventually you depopulate the area until you don't have enough people in Congress to object to another federal preserve or monument. To put that in perspective, in near me, which is why I kind of think that they were trying to ban barbed wire fences and, and electric fences in Lyon County. In perspective, that's the Flint Hills, that's cattle country there. So um, there is Tall Grass National Prairie. Only 34 acres of that land is owned by the federal government. I think it's my be 32. I can never remember. 32 or 34. The rest, almost 11,000 acres, is owned by the Nature Conservancy. And then the Nature Conservancy has perpetual conservation easements around that. All they're doing is waiting for the right Congress to come through to declare that. I've seen their original maps. They want the entire Flint Hills. From Nebraska down to Oklahoma. The whole entire bit. One of the ways that they're doing that is trying to talk you into getting rid of cat cattle fencing. So, believe it or not, I went to a, um, over there by the Chase County Preserve, I went to a program where they talked about putting shot collars on cows. That way you don't need fencing, right? And here's the thing that they're not telling you. Guess what they're running on Tall Grass National Prairie? Buffalo. If you remove your fences and the buffalo come on your land, cannot interfere. The federal government owns them. Mm -hmm. That's now a wilderness corridor. You see where this is going? Mm -hmm. So this map over here, I want you to take a look at. This is also another interactive map where you can scroll all the way down to your neighborhood. Some of those conservation easements are on this map. All that color there stands for Bureau of Land Management land, land, Forest Service land. Some of it is conservation easement land. Check out Alaska and Hawaii. 
That's all land in federal ownership or federal control. And remember, 30 by 30 is 30% 30 in the United States by the year 2030. I would say they're already there. So the question then becomes, where are they going to get their 30%? What we figured out is they're, they're logging up all that federal land. All of our favorite camping grounds, places that we love to fish, where we like to go hiking, they are slowly and methodically closing down public access to public land while they start making private property more public accessible. National Heritage Areas is one way to do that. National Trails is another. Do you know that when one of these national trails goes in, it becomes a National Park Service unit? We're right out the gate, as soon as Congress votes it in. Now Congress is told that it's just like naming a road. Congress is told, you all love the idea. You love it, it's great, it's wonderful. You think it's awesome. I mean, you didn't object, right? Because they kept it secret from you. So on their website, they talk about how this is all private property and you're not allowed to access it. But everywhere I go, when I run into people that have these trails to their property, they have problems. Because nobody ever gets down to the bottom of that, that uh, website when they're on the National Park Service website looking at trails. They always have trespassing. So when they start looking, at, and the Appalachian Trail over here is probably the best example. More than 400 properties have been eminent domain for the Appalachian Trail. And if you go to congress.gov, it's called filling in the gaps. They, uh, and once they get that area done, then they start harassing landowners through regula regulations, through whatever method that they can. Uh, I even heard a sob story about um, how they went to Congress and they showed them pictures of this dump and said, we need, we need permission to have a domain this, this is right along the trail and they're ruining it. And come to find out, it was, they think the picture came from foreign countries. These folks lie to Congress all the time. I get told by lawyers not to say that angel. They might take you to court for slander, but you know what? That's a two-way street. They take me to court, I get to ask questions. So, so these are interactive maps. Part of that is energy. So when I first got into this, trying to figure out why on earth they would try to ban barbed wire fences in Lyon County, and let me give you a little perspective on this. We have the Flint Hills Regional Council, and so this is what this document is out here. This is how the plan found us, that first page there. The Flint Hills Regional Council is a federal money fund, I guess you could say, for federal programs. And they incorporate all your counties and cities into these. So up in this area, I think over to the west, is the North Central Planning Commission. So they may not be called councils, they may be called commissions. Not everybody belongs to one. There are counties that do not belong to one of these. This is a direct line from the federal government to your county. And, and your county commissioners, they're just us. They don't stand a chance getting in front of these guys that have been taught and trained how to push these ideas onto the county. My county commissioners are so incredibly valuable. They have farms too. There is no except for county commissioners in our plans, right? What I didn't know at that time was the incredible ability to lie to our county commissioners. So to our elected officials, I would say to you, you are the first victims that they're going to try to sway. And what I need you to do is understand your role as the gatekeeper for the county. You are the gatekeeper, the first line of defense. So they went into a contract to write planning and zoning, and they shared that cost with the city of Emporia, and together they, they spent close to $500,000. In perspective, the average comprehensive planning and zoning regulations runs between twenty dollars and 30000 so close to half a million dollars they spent on this comprehensive plan and zoning regulations. They hired a firm out of Portland, Oregon called Urban Collaborative. Urban Collaborative primarily writes uh, regulations for and planning for military bases. Our author, Zoe Anton, has a company on the side, she's part of a company on the side, called Craft Cricket, and those were screenshots of her website, where they believe that livestock are ruining the earth 
in the protein of the future with books. So I came across this book in 2019. Who was president then? Right? These guys have been trained and are in place and have been there for quite some time. They have been working on this for years going on. So in that discovery, I found the Federal Economic Development Plan on the internet. Somebody had it on there. I was not smart enough to download it at that time. I was new to the fight, but I saw it with my own eyes. The Federal Economic Development Plan for the Plain State, so that's between the two mountain ranges, is to convert all this land to energy production and storage and tourism. So, the most interesting thing is, is that it takes out agriculture. Agriculture uses too much water, you need to know that. It's not a coincidence that our state legislature is suddenly working on water issues. Energy production and storage requires a lot of water. There's not enough water to do both irrigation, watering the livestock, and keeping server and data centers and lithium batteries pool. There's not enough. So we have to eliminate that agriculture. It's why Bourbon County came up with a new reservoir down in that county, whether the commissioners know what the long-term plan is or not. It's not a coincidence. Kansas is not the only one suffering these problems. So in addition to that, you have CO2 pipelines coming in, carbon capture. Right? Which is another big, ugly animal. I have no problem with that, really. I mean, it's a, it's a product that you can buy, sell, and trade. The problem is, is that only one or two companies get to reap all the rewards. And the reason why they want to pipe it in the ground and capture it, put it in the ground, do you know what happens to sludge carbon under shell rock after about 12 years? It becomes fossil fuel. Right? So, the reason they want to get rid of industry, in this document, it's very thorough as to why they want to get rid of industry. Industry has to go, and they use Flint, Michigan as the example. You bring in a manufacturer like the auto industry, you get everybody's high wages, everybody gets used to that, life is good, and then the manufacturing company closes down, and now you have this big impoverished population. So the best thing to do is to not have industry at all. That's their argument. Now they don't go into the details in this economic development plan as to how much water the energy needs. And they don't go into details about how they want to make all of this tourism. They just said that's the reason why they're going to make this tourism. It's because industry is bad. If it closes down, you're going to have too much impoverished people. So parks and tourism. And we've been writing and fighting on this parks avenue for a couple of years now, right? Three. So now every county is getting hit with solar farms and this transmission line. So I'm going to get the microphone to Grams now to talk about that transmission line. Okay, you, can, you heard a wonderful speaker. I'm usually behind the scenes. I'm not a public speaker. So I'm not a speaker. Oh, I'm not a public speaker. You just heard one. Uh, Very good one. So you think that I work behind the scenes. Uh, I became aware of this uh, transmission line coming through by a, a Facebook post by Carrie Barr, Representative Carrie Barr, had screenshotted my newspaper's article. So uh, I thought about it, I thought this is a land grab, and I was in my commissioner's office two days later uh, trying to get them to do a, uh, at least a public statement because the closing period for the public comment was on June 24th. We became aware on June 15th. That had been open since, I believe it was February 20th is when they opened the public comment period. Did anyone see a uh, notification in your newspapers? No. Uh, I verified, there we go, I verified with uh, Washington, Marshall, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar County that there were no notifications in the newspapers. Public notification is supposed to be given when there's public, when there's a federal project coming in and there's a public open comment period. 
It was maybe done online, but who goes online to look for it? So it was not done in the newspapers like it should have been. So they're, they're trying to see this thing in. Uh, this thing is 780 miles long. This, I'm talking about the Midwest Plains. That's one coming through your county. Starts at a solar farm down in Ford County, works its way north to the Smith Osborne County line, and then up through up to 36th Highway, Republic County, and straight over to Indiana, just inside the Indiana state line. 780 miles long, five miles wide. Now, if you take that, you, you think about it. And then I believe that it was figured out to be like 11 million acres that they're going to be taking out the production from this thing. I have a health study that shows there's four different studies from the NIH. Um, I know you go for NIH. Um, uh, no, the NIH. National Institute for Health. Health. Yes. Yeah, health. But uh, it, it shows the health hazards of uh, these EMS that are put out just by your cell phone. You've heard, you've heard that, that you're not supposed to keep your cell phones up uh, constantly around your ears. Well, this transmission line is going to be the uh, biggest power line that they have built in the state of Kansas. And I've heard in the country it's going to be carrying more power, more energy than any of these other, uh, like the Great Belt. It's picking up energy from Great Belt and these other smaller transmission lines. And it's carrying it over to Indiana. Kansas gets no benefit from this. The land owners get no benefit from this. You get no energy, you get no cash. Um, they are going to take it by eminent domain. I know the Fourth Amendment states that you have to compensate, but um, I haven't seen where they're going to negotiate. Uh, so they, they might negotiate with you. Um, they, I, I have no idea. They, there are, there's nothing in there in the plan. It just says we're going to take a bite of the domain. This was granted in the Jobs and Infrastructure Act that was passed. Um, the only two Kansas federal representatives that did not pass that voted no on that bill were uh, Senator Marshall and Representative Tracy Camp. The other three voted yes on it. So um, they are kind of responsible for this. In that, this, this transmission line plan, the NITC plan, had been stopped by court action. And so when this jobs and infrastructure bill came up, they decided to run it through that. When you get, you know, thousands of pages in a bill and you don't read the bill, you got to pass it to find out what's in it, you know. Uh, this was in there. And eminent domain was granted because our grid is unstable and intermittent. And these data centers are using too much energy. So they have to fix this problem. Uh, it has become a national emergency, so that. So, with that national emergency comes the national security risk. And that's when you bring in the heavy hand of the federal government. They're granted eminent domain because it's a national security risk. I contend, if they had not shut down permitting for your natural resources, gas, oil, coal, nuclear plants, would we be short on energy? Would we need all this solar and wind energy? I didn't think so. Um, so there's a fix to the problem. It's not taking farm and branch land out of production. Um, yeah, this thing, um, like I, when I said it was coming from Ford County, over Indiana, the Grain Belt Express also follows that line. They're, they're following along the same line as that Grain Belt Express. So if you have land close to that, you very well can be included in this transmission line, Brad. Uh, I, I, it's, it's not the same line, it is separate. We 
have nothing showing that it would be the same. I was told by Dr. Marshall's office that uh, Greg Belt was settled, all of those studies are done, uh, and letters have been negotiated. I just found out that uh, Greg Belt is 90% a done deal that the landowners have consented to uh, easements on that land. Uh, that, and that is different than this transmission line. They are negotiating easements. So they are getting compensation. Uh, the other 10% is in eminent domain. So they're arguing in court over it. And I believe that's in Missouri. Some of those are in Missouri. Missouri actually has a law that requires 150% compensation if they take my eminent domain, plus uh, they have to drop energy over there. Uh, Kansas has nothing, so we get nothing. Um, I do have some representatives that want to write some legislation on this, but they're not that safe until fall, so this is coming in the summer. Uh, Therefore, and one whereas. 
and I'm summarizing, it's, we don't like you, go away. <laughs> so, the sky's the limit, we, we do have templates out there, a lot of your counties and clerks are going to do the templates, not all of them. If you own the resolution, you do it the way you want to, same way with the letter. If you want to use that form, great, if you don't, you don't have to. If there's an idea out there on how to wipe some of these back, um, and that has worked, let me know. If you have a failure in which you did not succeed, let me know. So that um, I can either try it a different way, or avoid it, or whatever. I got asked how we're doing at the state level. We have introduced red, uh, legislation, Red Fairchild introduced legislation for us last year, promised to do it again this year, uh, asking for the state legislature to vote on federal jurisdictions of national heritage areas and national trails. Metropolitan area planning and zoning is other legislation that uh, Representative Ken Corbett introduced. Metropolitan area legislation is the parent legislation of joint comprehensive planning and zoning. The reason that the joint is being passed is to give your city land use policy over your county. Just by combining those planning and zoning boards, you end up with more city board members than you do county. And so the city is always going to vote for the best interest of the city. So now that is a theft of representation that's been going on in the metropolitan area around cities since the 1990s. And it was used to expand that to joint comprehensive planning and zoning between cities and counties. Representative Doug Black said it best when he talked about, well, not every county has planning and zoning, but most of the cities do. And in a case in his district, there is a um, uh, metropolitan area planning and zoning, but no county planning and zoning, no county board members. They're all from the city on this board. So in order to put up a building within that three mile area, you have to go pay your permit fees into the city and zoning office. And so the question is, is what well, is that not taxation without representation? So there is a bill trying to end these. We got, on both bills, we got our cost clean. Not so much on the National Heritage Area, we just didn't get the leadership to get it out of um, hearing to bring it on the floor, and we didn't push really hard, because with this governor, we're gonna need a two-thirds majority. So we have a lot more education to do on that subject. Metropolitan area planning and zoning, we got our clocks clean. The city um, unions, with the city associations, came up and fought us really hard, and we did, we, we didn't get out of committee, and lobbyists, with faith office, yes. So we got our clocks clean, so we need, we need more help on this. The same thing with the transmission lines. I don't know if you all know this, but all the way back in 20, 2008, legislation was being introduced into this legislature to pay this pathway for this energy. So all the laws that they need with this in are there already. Right. So now you have to push back on that. And so that's going to be even harder than that metropolitan area bill. Senator Mike Thompson, Thompson, out of Johnson County, I believe, that area, Kansas City area anyway, Overland Park. Yes. He's from the city. Yeah. So um, God bless him. I think he used to be a weatherman for a local news station up there. He knows, he gets it. He's been leading the charge on that, but he's, he hasn't had a, a great deal. I mean, there are carry bars. There are, I don't want to say he doesn't have a great deal of support, because he does. He just doesn't have enough. There needs to be more state back, state, uh, statewide pushback on that. So, do you have anything else before we open it up for question and answers? I can't think of what I was You can't think so that we might come up? Okay. So, I think, I think we're ready to do questions and answers. So, I guess if anybody has a question, just raise your hand and he'll bring it around the microphone to him. So, we want you to speak in the microphone because I do have this Facebook Live on my page. And um, we also have YouTube that is videoing this, and we want to make sure that your question is recorded. <clears throat> yes, my name is Jerry Oliver from Hiawatha. Uh, you talk about in your 3030 land grab book, and in number nine, 
paragraph 3, it talks about, well, they're trying to make out that we're losing farmland, but it said it had increased from 449 to 450 million. Now, it talks about a lot of the losses from burning forests, and we know what the government has done about that. They uh, just allow the forest to burn. So is that, it, you mentioned 2016 to 2024, but what, oh no, you, talk about up to 2016. What about 20 to 24? There's been a lot of fires in the forest. So everybody asks me what is what land is um, now preserved, and I say look to the west as to where the fires are starting, and that's that's preserved land. So their their um, their vision. And when I say they, you can include animal rights activists, you know, and all those kind of groups in there. Their vision is. Um, is a Garden of Eden where they don't have to grow anything, plow anything. They are going to visit it whenever they want, and they presume that burning is natural. So this document that he's talking about right here, number nine, this is produced by American Stewards of Liberty, and their website and phone number is, is on this. They are a phenomenal group of people. I love them. They allow me to duplicate these without having to pay any type of copyright fees. They're the ones that produced the 35 30 year resolution originally. So there is a, um, another document that talks about this, because I hear a lot, we're losing so much farmland to the cities. Well, that may be the case around Kansas City. You could even argue that that's the case around Manhattan, definitely Omaha, Nebraska. But generally, between the two mountain ranges, we have a lot more ghost towns now than we ever did before. The average population in these counties is leaving. Our equipment is getting better, bigger, and a lot more efficient. So we are producing more food per acre than we ever did before. My big thing on 30 by 30 is their argument is, is that man, we farmers, agriculture producers, are the ones that are ruining the earth. Yeah. Well, who's in control? Right? So if there's any ruining going on, who's fault is it? Right? So we got something to add on there? Well let me let me do um, let me do say that that you know what now I forgot. <laughs> I just want to say, when I hear people say that um, farmers are ruining the earth, and that's what these people think. Uh, cows fart too much, and the chemicals are ruining our water and, and, and soil and everything else. What I say is that farmers are the original environmentalists. These guys are things. Yes. They just want your land. They're coming at it any way they can come. What, so, what did Norman call it? Good. What did Norman call it? Covenant. Covenant. Yep. They covet your land. Socialism. Yeah. Here you go. So, uh, I just, it, it just really irritates me. So, the, um, the idea is, is to Get rid of private ownership, basically. Um, these ideas are pretty old. It goes back to Buffalo comments in the 1960s. When I first got into this, I got asked that question. Does this have anything to do with Buffalo comments? And I'm slightly young enough, I actually had to go look that up. Uh, the answer is yes. The only difference is this is the first time we've had an administration confess to doing what they've been doing out in Western states since the 1950s and 60s. So, I think we had a question over here. Okay, go ahead. So, I have to turn it off. Okay. I did first. Um, first, I'd like to start with a question and then make a statement. Do you have any idea, do you have any idea what this crap is? Oh, we're supposed to be around. Okay. This one. Alright, um, do you have any idea about how many homeowners? Landowners that this just in this stretch here coming across Brown County um, along that what 780 miles, how many people that affects? We have no idea. We have no idea whose land this is going to affect. We 
because they have a disclaimer in phase two on that NIETC uh, website. They have a disclaimer in there that states these lines are approximate. And so they can go in, uh, they've just gone into phase three, close, uh, phase two closed the library first. And so they're going into phase three, this is what I was going to say. Um, they are going into their study period where they have to go in and do these environmental impact and uh, all these studies that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and they are required to do public meetings. Uh, these studies, they have gone in and they try to speed up the, the permitting process and speed these studies up by changing the rules in there. So, um, I also discovered an article that says there's 20 states suing to stop them from speeding up that process and going to make them follow their own environmental impact rules that they make every other person follow that wants to put up a building or put a road in. Um, county commissioners know what you have to go through to, to build roads or make them bigger. Uh, so, they want to kind of skip some of those steps so they can get this transmission line pushed. Through. So, Co-op is in on that, Kansas is in on that lawsuit. There are 20 states uh, banded together to, to make a follow their own rules, and so that's going to buy a little more time. So, Co-op is? is, is yes, and, and Co-op is working on this. I am sending, when I get the resolutions back from the counties, I send them to our representatives, all of them, and I send them to uh, Chris Kobach. So, who's our attorney general? Who's our current? Yeah. Okay. So, for the folks on Facebook, there's our attorney general. Okay, so. Yeah. So, for the uh, comment portion, um, I'm just wondering what that was. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is us. Oh, <laughs> um, no, oh, so the federal government has already given the federal government. Permission to come and take some different land, eminent domain. I, I appreciate everything you ladies are doing. The information is great. We talk personally about this in other settings. But what do you honestly believe the chances of stopping this beast from consuming our land without more extreme measure? So um, I get I get really depressed sometimes, you know, because I've been in this since the banning of our wire fences. Sometimes I feel like I'm screaming um, into the wind and nobody's hearing. Sometimes, you know, financially, it's just it's kept my husband very well broke. Um, so there's just times that I want to quit. I just want to give up. I'm done. And there's a doctor I won't name. He's probably watching. There's a doctor that lives near me, and it just so happens one of those times I can walk out, and I was just, that's it, I'm done. Y'all, I can't, can't be a hero. It was during a week in which a lot of people from Colorado, especially with Colony, about their own properties getting eminent domain, and they wanted me to fight their battle for them. Guess what? You're on your own. I was on my own. Y'all are on your own. None of these groups, unless most of your legal groups, unless it's a sure case they know they're going to win, they don't want to start the process. And the ones that do, man, there's a long waiting list to get to them, right? So I'm feeling that. And I come walking out, and this doctor said to me, Angel, he said, you have to remember, at the time of our founding in the Revolutionary War, only 12% of the population supported it. Only 8% actually committed money, land, dollars, and time. And only 3% actually fought it. He said, you don't need everybody to change the direction of the nation. So I'm going to tell you, it's an uphill battle. You're on your own. It's hard. It's time consuming. And it's frustrating. But we have some success stories. We have the National Heritage Areas we beat back. We have the success of the EPA. So it can be done. Just don't give up. I just want to add that if we don't fight, then we are giving up. And nothing is going to happen. We're going to lose our land. We're going to be living in the cities stacked up on top of it. 
them because that's where they want us. That's why they want us in those little electric cars and only drive for an hour and then you have to recharge them because you're not going to need to drive that car. You're not going to need to drive it. You know that was the in our yes. So in, in Emporia, Kansas, so in Emporia, Kansas, in a population of 24,000, that was actually in our plan. And if you went to the planning and zoning administrator's Facebook page that he ran, he actually talked about how great this will be to either eliminate these automobiles, and it would be so wonderful for the environment. And I went in there and I said, look, man, you don't get it. I have a big dually pickup truck. There's no way I can get my dually pickup in these parking lanes that you're making and these narrow roads that you're creating. And he just kind of stood there and looked at me. It was me that was stupid. I didn't get it. I wasn't going to have a dog that they go with the big guy. So, but we fought that back. Even then, they told us that we couldn't do it. That that is stacked against you, the mountain is high. It is. There's a blue shirt all the way. I see one guy back there. Another one up here. When they talk about heritage sites, define that, please, to, to the extent of in our municipality here, in our local county. That's an excellent question, because you have several layers of heritage sites. On a federal level, it is a, um, it is, I call it the SHPO. It's an actual inventory list that the federal government has that has sites on there that are registered. And then those technically cannot get out on there without the, loan, the uh, landowner or property owner's permission. <coughs> and then you have what's called the potential. And that's everything below. So what they'd like to do, and the National Heritage Area is a very good example, what the National Heritage Area is like to do is they get in, in cahoots with the local college and they like to use college students because who, at 70 years old, which most of your landowners are over 60, right? Who's going to say no to a young college kid who just is out there counting rings on a tree for their, for their assignment for school, right? Which you don't realize they're doing is they're actually putting your property on a potential inventory list. And they're using students to do that work for free. So you have, um, you have inventory lists that are uh, already designated, and then you have ones that are potential. Now there is a case in the scam book that Norman talks about out there in which a landowner did not find out that his property was in a potential list until he went to go to the bank to get a loan out to expand his watering up to a, a new pasture area. And when he did that, the banker said, well, wait a minute, you have a potential historical site here. They had to get the county attorney to get involved to get that property removed off of that potential list. So it's all about the inventory list. And I can tell you that today it is this, but in all actuality, a month from now, when that word becomes unpopular, they'll just change it. So uh, I would revert back to inventory list. The, the acronym for it is SHPO, is what we call it. And it's the federal inventory list that are also shared with the state, and they're probably listed in the Kansas Historical Society. So the most frustrating thing about that is they're often wrong. So the Chisholm Trail, there's a, a potential trail destination coming up called the Western and Chisholm Trail through Kansas. And it starts in Texas and goes all the way up, of course, to Oklahoma along the old Chisholm Trail. I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted by landowners along that potential trail to say, they're wrong. We know they're wrong. Even historians have contacted me down in Texas to tell me that the national trail designation that they're wanting is wrong. It's not where the actual trail is. So it's incredibly frustrating. But that's also a tool. Use it to your advantage. If you can delay these projects at the congressional level by saying, hey, there might be a potential site here, how dare you? Use the endangered species. You probably have some here. Use it in order to get that to be delayed until you can talk Congress into defunding that project. I've also found some uh, documentation where 
where they had come back in and redesignated some trails coming through Kansas uh, to include some offshoots of these trails. Maybe there was a creek that was too high or a river too high they couldn't cross or a mountain pass they couldn't get through. And so they would drive, they would take a wagon train to drive the cattle to a different pass. And they went back and revamped this trail. And this was in 2020, I believe, that they included those in the National Trail System, too. Was and I guess it was landowner didn't know. Yeah, I was going to say, was anybody told? I don't believe anybody was told, probably. Most likely. I can't say that for sure. Um, but I know it was done. And, and that's just crazy. <laughs> I haven't met one landowner, not even in that heritage area, that it covers 49 counties. I never met one landowner that knew. I was in Cherokee County on Thursday night in an afternoon full of folks there. I said, please raise your hand if you knew you were in a federal boundary called the National Heritage Area. The only one that raised their hand was the board member that was there. <laughs> there to debate me. So no, not one resident there even knew that they were in one of these. So that, that comes back to that planning and zoning. It's not a coincidence that your commission is having a hard time getting money for roads, but there seems to be all kinds of money for trails. That was funded, called MAP 21, in the budget back in 2012, 2015. Started in 2008, without the big funding in 2012, 2015. That's money earmarked through the Department of Transportation that's sitting in KDOT right now to build trails all over the state that's part of the tourism aspect of the energy production in tourism. The most frustrating thing about that is, is that the money is there to build the trails, the maintenance, and policing of those trails end up falling on your local municipality. I can tell you, because I've seen them with my own eyes, a lot of those public use trails in Topeka are homeless camps. Those need to be policed with a police force, right? And then you have flooding that goes on, because a lot of them are along creeks and rivers. All of that needs to be maintained. So it's very tempting to take that money to build a new trail, especially if it's underneath uh, county land under a power line or along an old railroad right away. It's very tempting to take that money. But remember, you're going to be stuck with the bill. They are shutting down a lot of the money for roads. When the interstate came in, that became a partnership with a lot of your state and local municipalities in repairing roads and bridges and keeping them up. The federal government became a partnership. Your local municipalities and commissions are now starting to see not as much money coming in. Additionally, we've had several county commissioners say they've been threatened that if they do not go along with this, or whatever project is in their area, that they're going to withdraw even more money for roads and bridges. So your county commissioners need your support and need your backup on that. I can tell you that although I've seen that thread and heard about it, not one time has it ever come true. Not in the state of Kansas that I'm aware of. But your county commissioners are in a tough spot. So now, the genius, your, your best county commissioners are the genius ones, can figure out how to take that trail money, right? Put it in those potholes in the middle of your road. So, so even though, you know, they're going to have to get creative in order to do that, but that money is sitting in the Department of Transportation in Kansas, in every state, in all 50 states, for building trails. That's part of that, that tourism. Microphone's coming up to you. I know. I'm not here, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so you mentioned the Great Yellow Express, which I, I've heard about, and I live close to you. Um, I do not have any land where this Great Belt is going through, but I still live close. I need a place where I can go and research and look at this. I've been on their website, but it's all rainbows and candy and beautiful, and I know that's not not the truth. Um, also, I need to know, or maybe I misunderstood, we're talking about the Grand Belt Express, and then you said another line. Is there actually two lines going through this, this spot? Or did I misunderstand? We really don't know what is going through there. I mean, there could be multiple lines within that five mile uh, zone, or uh, where I was told when I first started this, that they needed that five miles because of the, the 
Thompson, this thing was going to be dropping because the amount of power that was coming through it. But I've also heard that there may be multiple lines. We're not going to know until they go through uh, phase three and start their public meetings. Um, <laughs> and we did find out. I mean, we're, we're just not going to know exactly where that line's going to be or what's going to be in it until they're, they're finished with phase three and such. They're supposed to map it out. We'll know if your land is in there or not at that time. Um, it's the eminent domain. Yes, the eminent domain. So, so to clarify, transmission lines are nothing new, right? We've all been dealing with them forever, right? Very rarely do they have to eminent domain a large swath of land. So it is the it is the eminent domain that caused the attention here, and it's the width of five miles. But there's speculation as to just exactly um, how much of that is going to be relays, how much of that is going to be uh, battery storage along the way. Where a lot of relays are going to be needed for this. Um, I've talked to every line man that I can possibly think of and everybody that I know in electricity, and they don't think that there is a power line anywhere in the world that would require a five mile width, and that it would interfere with airplanes and remote control traffic and everything else. So their speculation is, is that there's some gravy going on there, wilderness corridor, additional lines, um, the whole nine yards. We know that the um, Grand Belt Express is kind of an introduction. It is part of this program, but it's also separate too. So this was the introduction to get you ready for the big stuff coming in. We have a... Okay. I do have a question uh, and comment after that. So, maybe I'm missing it, but you say it's been in the domain already. The federal government gave the federal government or the entity to be able to take it. But yet, passing resolution doesn't like it. So, no other domain has been done in the state of Kansas that we know of. So that it's not started. They're simply asking for permission right now and saying that they're, they're talking about it. So what a resolution does is it, um, well, it does, it destroys their narrative. It destroys their why that y'all want this, that you're not objecting to this, and that it's going to be wonderful. And so it helps Congress to then make those decisions objectively. I mean, it only took seven resolutions to get Ron Estes involved. So just seven on that EPA. So that's the first thing it does. Does it protect your property? It is a cheap, easy eyewitness testimony in the court of any law. Your Honor, right here, this organization from my county said this. It also helps at your state level. Remember, although most of those legislators we're not here when a lot of this groundwork was laid in. The groundwork is already there. And these resolutions help teach them that it's okay to be against this to undo some of that work. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, another interesting comment that I ran across actually when we were uh, at a vendor event uh, selling honey. Uh, we had a college student approached us, found out we were from this area, and they were very interested in doing studies on uh, pollinators to see their effects on it. I know. So it, I, I'm not saying that's what it was, but it was interesting that when I started pushing back about their involvement in harvest and things like that, so that, that it wouldn't hamper our, our production. That person lost interest really fast, but they were really interested in one of those studies that we in this area. So keep in mind, a lot of these kids, especially from the colleges, they're being used, and they don't know what they're being used for. So the information that they glean, they might be one thing, but because they're filling out a long list of things, what the actual thing that the government wants is way down here. So you have to keep that in mind. So if, if, I will not let anybody on my property for any kind of studies after learning what I have learned. There's nobody, no. So, um, and I have a couple of big dogs, 
in my yard. I have to, the gates are a pain in the butt to have to go in and out, but they're there. I make such a ruckus in Lyon County that I have I have no zero trust whatsoever. If you're going to come on my property, you better be born. So, um, so there there is that. I would not I would not automatically assume that they're nefarious because there's a good chance that they might not be or that they don't know what they're being used for, but just for your own protection, I would allow anybody to do studies. I'm Matt Levader from Jackson County. And my question to you is, can, these people that are against us have a lot of money. Can we donate money to an organization to help them? Can we give you some money tonight to cost you gas to get here? That sort of thing. God bless you. My husband will be, if you want to pass the hat, my husband. $20. <laughs> 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 Everything is possible. Just don't give up. You've got to stand for our land. 
proclamation. So there's also, there is one other option that you can do. If you can get all the counties to work together, there is something that, um, that American Stewards of Liberty kind of um, taught, uh, especially out in Colorado, down in Texas, how to do. And that's called coordination. It's a little bit above my head, and there's no way I can explain it to you and give it justice. But I do have their, I do have their booklet here, and it is sold on the website. But it is counties working together. And I remember I went to a class, and this to Margaret talk about it, how she got. Um, so as a county, you have the right, and they did this in Coffee County, and didn't even realize it. They, you have a right to ask to speak to the um, the organizers of whatever it is you're against. In that case, it was wind energy or transmission line, actually. It was transmission line dominant. And so they met with all of the federal regulators, and they walked into this room full of lawyers. What they didn't realize that they were doing at that time was they were doing coordination. There are very specific rules that the federal government has to do in order to do any project. One of those rules is, is they are to work with local governments. So if you call them out on that, you can corner them. And Margaret Bifield talks about the success that they have had through coordination. She explains it here in this book. And I, I don't know that I can get into the weeds and do it justice. But um, that is another option. The biggest problem that you have is you've got to get at least a couple counties together, at least have all your ducks in a row. I think one county can do it. She talks about how one county can do this down there, but they had a room full of experts so that when they sat across the table from these federal officials, they knew exactly what to say, when to say it, and how to respond to everything. And then they owned the room. And they were able to defeat a couple of big federal projects that was skipping right over the state. We have a couple more questions, I think, on this side. I just have a fast question. How does this affect tribal reservation land? We have three reservations in Brown County. If these transmission lines go through through that, is that a separate issue or do they have a little more clout than so, so how would that affect it? So I would say, so the question is, is on tribal lands. I would say that um, that the tribes are being used. They're kind of like um, my county commissioners there. They are being used and they are being told that everything's going to be wonderful and they're going to benefit a great deal, that they're going to get energy out of these transmission lines even though the rest of Kansas might not, that they themselves will get energy if it goes through their um, reservation lands. But, so most of the tribes that I know are in cooperation with the federal government, but not all of them. So, if you look at, um, if you look at tribal land, I grew up near uh, the Sioux Indian Reservation, the Winnebago Indian Reservation, up in uh, South Sioux City, Nebraska. And I always thought that a reservation to me was pretty close to communism, because they really don't own their land, right? They have to go through tribal council to do everything. So I get the impression that that's kind of what the government would like to do with all of our land, right? Um, they're victimized easily. My dad was a, my daddy who raised me, not, not, not my dad. So I grew up in a pretty, pretty um, hard uh, family, only because uh, they were old by the time I came around and wore out. But in his younger days, as a truck driver, he would take full advantage of reservation land because he could run heavy without needing the permits as a truck driver. So to me, they're just convenient um, stepping stone because the federal government already regards their land as theirs. Oklahoma is a good example of that. You're familiar with Oklahoma laws that they have teamed up with um, tribes in Oklahoma. Look at how the federal government looks at the state of Oklahoma. That's the federal government's perspective of Oklahoma. So that's how they're kind of viewing all the tribes. Sure, speaking. Once again, Matt Debaters, if anyone wants to get me on the list somewhere, I'm not afraid. <laughs> um, speaking about the tribe, tribal land, 
Well, I recently ran for County Commissioner in District 2 in Jackson County. Uh, I, the Prairie Band and Palo Alto Nation is primarily a bit of my district. I spent a lot of time talking to those folks down there. And I would agree with what you said. Their government might be somewhere our government, you know, participate, getting the money, doing what they, you know, what they want to do, restrict the cash. But I'd also say that I really encourage people that live around tribal lands to identify your friends and neighbors there that feel the same way. Because I think you're going to find, like I found, a lot of people in Caribbean just want to be left alone. And that's what, I, that's what my friends are. We just want to live free. We want to live life done free, be left alone. And there's a lot of tribal members feel the same way. And so I really, really encourage all you folks here that know folks out there, get them involved. So the next time there's a meeting like this, maybe it's a meeting where it's a hearing, and not only do we have this 120 people, we got 120 tribal members, or 120 from each tribe. But get them involved. Any of them, any of them is definitely my friend on that side. Yes, I would, most of them that I know um, who live on the reservation regard that as their home, their sovereign nation. And I don't think that their leadership realizes that um, that they're a target as well, which is more control. So, was there any other questions? I thought I saw some a hand several times over here. Was that you, Bill? Was someone else? I had a hand over here. Oh, okay. Let's okay. stop. I want to make sure I don't represent BC on A because I'm one of those radical white farmers. And uh, <laughs> I'd just like to say that uh, unlike the Olympics, I look around here and I mean diversity, equity, inclusion isn't happening here. I see a lot of white faces in here. But uh, what I'm trying to say, then I find out there's a bunch of farmers in here holding their hands up. But uh, touching on what you said about your yard, there in uh, paragraph 13.4 it talks about they advocate for unlocking access to landlocked public lands for hunters and recreationists, which require public access across public, public or private lands. And then uh, maybe along with what Chris is saying, maybe I didn't follow this 14-day deal, but in uh, or 14, paragraph 1, it says February 11, 2021, the Acting Secretary of DOI, Department of Interior, rescinded an important policy that allowed local governments and the states to veto a federal land acquisition proposed through the LWCF. In Secretarial Order 339, O'Biden, Acting Secretary of DI, DOI, revoked his protection, clearing a critical hurdle that would have protected private lands from federal acquisition, going along with what Chris said. And, uh, I mean, I don't like uh, talking to people's backs. I mean, I like to talk to people to their face. So, Brian, where did you go? I have a $2 bill I printed up here. It's got Thomas Jefferson on the front, and a signed declaration on the back. It's the only one we brought up so. but, uh, Anyway, I'm not a very good guy. Oh, I'm trying to do my John Kennedy to Louisiana voice, but being South government was full of these white founding fathers way back when, okay? They took the land from the Indians, and we're talking about the tribes here. Why isn't the government giving this land back to the Indians instead of taking it? I would refer that question a letter and ask that of them, please. I would, I would love that answer myself. So, um, we talked an awful lot about a, a room full of white people. We are the discriminated class, right? Right now, farmers are the discriminated class. So, I get asked a lot about why I do this, what's in it for me. And I want to tell you I have two little grandbabies. That, that's great, grandma's. Yeah, to you. I have two little grandbabies that have type 1 diabetes. I'm sure that there are some diabetics in the room. The statistics says that there is. But uh, my little grandbabies who are 11 and 13 now, diagnosed the first one several years ago. You know, meat is the only food group in which they do not have to take an insulin bolus for. And 
right now it is the most expensive product for my daughter to buy. We are the discriminating class. The long-term goal, you have to know, is to import our food through a very select handful of mon monopolies over in Africa. Now, I would tell you that that's a conspiracy theory. It's a guy went to their meetings. And their videos are on YouTube. It's called U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. This is the infomercial for the World Economic Forum. And a couple of years ago, they met at Cargill in Wichita. And in that room was Governor Kelly, Jake Turner, a handful of state representatives, the guy that runs Shock Campus Farms, professors from Washington University. These are policymakers within our state who are leading the direction in our state who attended an infomercial for the World Economic Forum. Now, don't jump to conclusions. The food was really good. And I know a couple of those state representatives were there for the food, and a few more were there to spy like I was. So, but these are the policy makers that the World Economic Forum to the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition is talking to. And the main talking points were that agriculture is ruining the planet, right? We have to do those sustainable developments. And so the next breadbasket is going to be in Africa. Now, they didn't say that plainly. They didn't say that bluntly. They said it all in a circle, all the way around. I just knew what to listen for. I took a registered nurse with me. And on the way home, I asked her, what did you take from that meeting? She said that we're building nuclear power plants in Africa, but taking them down here in the United States. Coal, coal plants, too. No, it was like coal, too. But yes, so our Department of Defense built a nuclear power plant in Africa to build the infrastructure for our food. Transportation is going the same way. Cargill, remember when you heard the ships um, are going to become sailboats again in order to save the planet? That's Cargill. Those are Cargill's transportation ships. Now keep this in mind. At Cargill, which is the largest cattle trader in the world probably, definitely in the United States, the largest cattle trader in the world. I got a tour of the place because I drive early. I don't know if you know this, but the longer I live in the country, the more I hate driving in the city. So I go early, I went into Wichita, and I got to talk to some of the folks that work there. And after the meeting, I got a tour. Guess what? I saw the kitchen where they test fake meat. So the largest cattle trader who buys and sells cattle on big screens throughout their building has a kitchen to test fake meat. So what's in it for them? They want to be the monopoly. They don't care what they sell you as long as all your only choice is to buy from them. This is the East India Trading Company all over again, right? So, that is the goal. They are partnering with our federal government in order to, to build this big, huge monopoly in Africa. So I called some friends in a few other organizations and they said, oh, welcome to what we know. Now get on those foreign um, websites and look at some of that foreign news. Guess what most of the countries in Africa call climate change in 30 by 30? call it climate colonialism or climate imperialism. They're calling it what it is. It is an effort of Western nations to take over Africa all over again. So if they can grow it in Africa and they can turn all of this into energy production and, and their parks for their enjoyment, then all food will be shipped and transported in from Africa. And that sounds ridiculous. But go down to the grocery store. How much of the products on the shelf in the grocery store are from this county? Or from the state? So it's definitely doable, and it is what they're working for. And then you have several handfuls of these huge corporations all vying to be the next big federal partner and the next East India Trade Company.
took it from the Indians. They created a reservation. What do they do with that reservation? What's the definition of a reservation? It's a jail. They locked the Indians on the jail. They killed them or they imprisoned them back in the day when they got off that reservation. We still call them reservations today. So what this whole program, what I'm getting out of it tonight, is we're being made a reservation. No different than the Indians. We're being a reservation. And if we stand up and fight back, it's going to happen to us. As she said, look at the prices in your grocery store. Look at the prices at the gas station. Look at the taxes here in Brown County and all over the state. My property tax in Horton Kansas went up on three different properties over 100%. It went up over 75% last year. Don't pay them. Where's it going to go if they don't put a stop on and it ain't just here in Brown County. It's, it's not only in the state of Kansas, it's with our federal government. And folks are telling you we need to fight back. For it is going to come to a civil war again. Uh, That's my story, to... and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, let's, let's not get to a civil war, though, because, you know, if, if we get to that point in this country, it's those little grandbabies of mine that rely on insulin that'll be the first to go. So we have to. We have to fight this back without it ever getting to that point, right? We can't, yeah. So, there, it's, it's due to fail. No matter how far they get, eventually, it's going to fail. The question is, how many of us can they kill the process with all of these stupid ideas? And it's about exposing And it's about, yeah, and, and what Graham says, it's about exposing them. So the biggest fear amongst the, the people is us. I, I can tell you that there isn't a political organization that doesn't ask me for their endorsement. I, and I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just a goat farmer for one kind of camp, you know, an old soldier's farm. So um, they, grassroots apparently is the strongest thing in this country. Are there any other questions? Have an organization started too, right here in Brown County, and I was in Madison. I'm from Madison, live in Madison County. I suggest we get a committee, which we've got a dead and Kendra here started for dead members. I know that committee, but instead of each and every one of us having our own ideas, let's, let's get them all together and let's get a committee going because, again, I stand by the call. And this is going to all just flood it. Let's, let's come to a committee. Let's do your work first. Let's start with a resolution. Yes. Well, so that leads into a reminder that tomorrow morning you're speaking to the commissioners at 10 o'clock, be there early, and it's good to hear that and it's good to show our commissioners that we care. They need to see numbers. Also, um, the lady Wash, and Derek had to step out, but you met him at the beginning of the meeting. He is going to move forward on these property rights and these in. And anything that's related to industrial energy. So, like, if you have ideas, if you want to be involved, if you want to see action on that, BCLA covers a broad array of topics. We'll definitely be involved, some of us will be there, but the lady watch is going to be the one to take the step off from tonight <coughs> and move forward. So, if you didn't want to sign up on his list for emails, add your email to that and wait for him to be in contact. Check your emails, looking for um, the next meeting or the next educational opportunity. And I just want to add one thing real quick before everybody leaves. Rowdy Meyer, uh, who's filming this, said this will be up and available tomorrow on the website. And it's out there on our poster board if you want to take a picture of it before you leave. It's Northeast Kansas Open Government on YouTube, but he will have this up and going tomorrow for people to see. Really I do. I do have some information on the solar farms that just brought to mind. Uh, I read an article about uh, like 10,000 acre uh, solar farm out in Cal uh, California in the Napa Valley where they grow awesome vegetables. I mean, that's all they do is agriculture in that valley. Uh, he leased his farm for 10,000 acres to this solar company that promised him to be able at the end of the life of these, which is like 15
15, 20 years. Uh, he would be able to farm that ground again. Uh, about two years in, I believe it was, he noticed the ground was really weird, really strange and dead. So he took a couple of soil samples in, had it analyzed, and he was told that no one would be farming that ground again for one to five hundred years. So that's the kind of toxins that the solar panels would be dropping into the land underneath. Can they find, where can they find that study? I don't remember where I, I read it somewhere. I don't even know that I, I'll have to dig it up. Yeah. So, I do have um, a website called Western Region Property Rights Coalition where you can find a lot of the resolutions if you didn't get a chance to pick any up. You can find links to Norman's books that have, um, like I said, the uh, Freedom of Information Request Language is my favorite part of his books and that kind of the how to uh, fight these things back. If you get a resolution or a letter or something that we can use and share, Please reach out to us, get us a copy, uh, mail it to us, uh, email it to us to which Montana, what's your email? It's Montana Cowgirl at att.net. Say that again. Montana Cowgirls at att.net. And I have a business card right on the table with my cell phone number if you have any follow-up questions later on. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know it's been a long video. I um, hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned something. You know, at the end of the day, we have to be smart enough to understand that what affects our neighbors will ultimately affect us. The problem is if we don't stand up for our neighbors, there'll be nobody left to stand up for us when they come for us. And they are coming. This land grab is over 100 million acres of farmland. It's right in the middle of the United States, or at least the vast majority of it is. You guys want to starve the beast? Part of this is understanding what your rights are. Part of this is understanding how to fight back. Part of this is understanding how to use the system to be able to affect change. But at the end of the day... <laughs>